Thank you guys for leading us. I love that song. I love the truth uh, that we can come as we are. I hope that that brings freedom to your soul. Jesus did not require you to live up to any type of expectation in order to walk in tonight. He invites you to come as you are, and he's gracious enough to change you so that you don't leave as you are. Uh, he is pouring into you. Ah, children. Jaden, you know. Go on. Children's church. <laughs> uh, thank you, Val, for leading tonight. She stepped in. The Brits uh, are not here. If you're watching, Angela, we love you. We miss you guys, Rodney and family. They're getting over. They are pretty much over COVID. Um, and so Val jumped in. Speaking of COVID, if you have kids that are normally in the preschool hall, um, thank you again for being flexible. We, we had to make the decision to, to close it down for tonight. Uh, one of our main leaders came down with COVID uh, and exposed others. And so this is kind of what we were left to do. So thank you. Uh, again, I've said it many times, for flexibility and for patience and for understanding tonight. Um, before we dive in, I'll just give, uh, I, I like to communicate, I like to tell you all what's going on so we're all on the same page as far as church life goes. Um, this is our first now weekend without Pastor Marty, right? Last weekend was his last weekend, uh, and it was a great weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, but now we're, we're moving into a new chapter, so to speak. Uh, some have asked me, well, are we going to have an interim pastor? Um, at this point, no. Our, our staff feels capable to lead and, and shepherd well during this in-between phase. Um, we're actively pursuing a, a pastoral candidate. That's all I can tell you. That's all I know. I'll update you as I know further. Um, as far as su Saturday and Sunday go in the month of March, uh, as you know, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. We'll finish that at the end of the month, uh, while on Sunday they're going through a different kind of series of messages focusing on transition and ministry, uh, evangelism, discipleship. Uh, Palm Sunday will then be at the end of March. And so our plan then is to, to reunite on Easter weekend um, and hit the ground running in a new series. Uh, we really did want to take a moment to breathe and to process uh, during this month before we just dove headfirst into something else. And so, again, I'm excited, church, for the coming days, the coming months, the coming years. I pray that uh, we would embrace this time of, of transition and trust what the Lord is doing. Let's dive into Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we're going to start by reading the passage together, Matthew 6, 25. Um, and matter of fact, before you kind of start scurrying through the pages there, Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray again. I know we just prayed, but let's pray again and ask the Lord to speak tonight. Father, we come before you as we open your word uh, to talk about and deal with this issue of anxiety and worry that you, that you address uh, in the sermon. And so, Father, but there are some in here right now who are just anxious. Um, God, I, I feel like I have a, a, a sense of anxiousness right now. And so we pray as we approach your word that you would, uh, God, pour your spirit out on us. If there's anything we need tonight, anything at all, God, it is your presence, it is your spirit, it is a, a work of your hand in our lives. So we pray, God, that you would do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 6, 25, you can be turning there. I remember in seminary, uh, one of my professors always said, give the congregation time to turn to the passage before you read it. There's nothing more frustrating than getting through half the passage and they're still trying to get there. Matthew 5, 6, 25. Anybody still need time? All right, let's read together. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or, or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Verse 27, and which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? That was the verse my dad always would paraphrase, keyword paraphrase, for me when I was growing up. I was a worried kid, man, really was. And he'd always say, uh, worrying about it ain't going to solve nothing, right? So that's kind of the southern translation there for us. Consider, he says, the, the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? 
Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So let's remember, uh, big picture, the Sermon on the Mount comes to us from Jesus, uh, not as some prerequisite to uh, following after Christ, all right? He's not saying to us, hey, be meek, be humble, uh, be poor in spirit if you want to follow me. Uh, It's the opposite, right? He's preaching and showing us, man, this is what happens when you do surrender your life to me, right? It's come as you are, and this is how you, this is what you conform to, the character of Christ, the culture of the kingdom of God. And so this sermon is, is this big picture that he's giving us of what it looks like to be a, a member of the household of God, to be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. He's given us that picture. But he knows that we struggle often to walk in this freedom and to walk in these ways and to conform to the character of Christ because sometimes there's this ob- obstacle of anxiety and worry And he brings that up tonight in his sermon and in in this passage. He addresses it. He knows that when it comes to walking daily and to surrendering to Christ daily, some of us get hung up in this place of of paralyzing anxiety. right? And and, and tonight he's going to address a, a certain type of anxiety. He's not necessarily talking about an anxiety disorder or a diagnosis per se. And... We can have that conversation and need to have that conversation. But what Jesus is primarily talking about here is this type of anxiousness that, that is ultimately rooted in unbelief. All right? It's this anxiousness that drives us to, to, to be in the control seat at all times. It is a type of anxiousness that is, is actively displaying who we really believe is in control. Is it us? Is it God? I remember a year ago, really to the month, when the pandemic hit and and everybody rushed out to the grocery store to buy what? Toilet paper. Not food. (laughs) Don't need that. Toilet paper. And I remember an article came out afterwards written by a psychologist and he said that was people's attempt to gain control in the midst of mass chaos. He said it was a psychological phenomenon. People thought that if they could get their hands on this diminishing you know, asset or whatever, then they were somehow satisfying that itch within them to gain control. We're a people who love control. Further clarification, Jesus here is not saying, hey, if you worry, then you're, you're of the devil. If you ever have any worrying thought, you should suppress it. If you ever have a worrying thought, then, then you're not a child of God. Right? He's not saying that. In fact, there are times you should worry, right? If your kid is is playing in the street, you should worry. You should go and get them. It would be irresponsible not to. Paul even says in 2 Corinthians, I've got this daily pressure on me and this anxiety because of these churches. In other words, there are things that should burden us. There are things that uh, we should be concerned about. But those concerns can cross the line into ungodly anxiousness when we seek to eliminate the space in which God's hand is at work in the situation. For example, if you kept your kid inside locked up 24-7 because you were afraid of the possibility that he or she may or may not go to the street, then you are acting as if you have to control the situation. Or if Paul, if he had just said, you know what, I quit ministry. Or, on the other end of the spectrum, I'm going to micromanage every single little aspect of ministry. That would have been an attempt to gain control. He would have been crossing that line into ungodly anxiousness that is ultimately rooted in unbelief. Ultimately rooted in the fact that we have to be the ones controlling situations. I find it ironic that we live in a world of more... Growing conveniences, more luxuries, 
more technology. Yet we are more and more anxious, more and more stressed, less and less happy. (laughs) Pre-COVID even, anxiety levels were on the rise. During COVID, that's been exasperated. Uh, American Psychological Association says that 78% of adults uh, have reported significant increase in stress during the pandemic. They stated that we're in the middle of a national uh, mental health crisis. And no one's talking about it. There's a problem right now. I thought it was interesting that between 2007 and 2012, uh, anxiety among teenagers skyrocketed, never to return. What device came out in 2007? The iPhone. Two years later, Twitter becomes popular. One year later, Instagram comes out. A couple years after this, when this crisis is at an all-time high, there's an article that comes out addressing the issue. It says this, sociologists who measure anxiety levels of entire nations have concluded that the U.S. is by far the most anxious nation on earth. About one in three Americans can be expected to suffer anxiety at some point in their lifetime. Curiously, nations where people face more basic struggles in life, like securing clean water to drink, are markedly less anxious than Americans. What are we missing What's our problem? We've got everything we could want, but we're the most anxious nation in the world. I think it has a lot to do with what Jesus said two weeks ago in the passage right before this as he talked about our obsession to store up treasures on earth, right? We're a people who are bent on trying to satisfy an eternal longing with temporary things, We're trying to fill a God-sized hole with man-made toys. And every deposit we make with a man-made toy leaves us panicked because we thought it would satisfy us, and it didn't. So we panic, and we do it again. And then we panic, and we do it again. And our anxiety creeps up every step of the way. That's why the charts are all going up. That's why Americans are so anxious. We've been trying to fill God-sized holes with man-made toys, and it doesn't work. So how does Jesus approach this problem? We've got a pandemic for sure. It's an anxiety pandemic. And it stands in the way of freedom. How does Jesus address it? He says, first of all, therefore, it's what we just said. He's calling to mind what he's, what he's already said. Therefore, since material items don't bring fulfillment, therefore, since money cannot satisfy you, don't pursue it as if it can. Don't be anxious because you don't need to go and obtain for yourself these things in order to find contentment and satisfaction. It's not left up to you in order to obtain these things. So don't be anxious about it. A couple years ago when our oldest son, Jaden, moved in, he had a tendency that a lot of foster kids have, which is to, to take food from the pantry when no one's looking, right? Because... It was wired into him at a young age. Look out for yourself because nobody else will. And here we are, a couple years down the road, he still has that tendency. And I'm like, Jaden, I will give you food, man. You don't have to worry. I've got it. But it's hard for him to reverse what was programmed into him to look out for himself. Look, because of sin, we have this malfunction in our infrastructure that says you have to look out for yourself right we come and we worship our heavenly father and then we go and sneak stuff from the closet because we don't think he's going to provide for us it's the same problem we have the same tendencies and it's rooted ultimately in this cycle of unbelief so jesus references what he talked about and he then commands us don't be anxious as if that's really ever worked. Hey, calm down. When's that ever worked for anybody? Have you ever been in an argument with your spouse and, and you say, hey, hey, just, just calm down? Like, how'd that go for you? That's never actually comforting when someone just commands you to relax. It's really triggering, to be honest. Usually has the opposite effect, right? But, but Jesus is coming and he's saying, therefore, and he gives a commandment. Do not be anxious. Here's why it's comforting from Jesus. Here's why we can receive it as a comfort. 
Because when the Prince of Peace commands this, he's saying it from a position where he can see past, present, and future. If he can look at you and know what's around the corner for your life and still say to you, don't be anxious, you can trust it. Because it means he, he is keeping you alive to see you through it. He knows what's coming and you can trust him. If you came to me and you said, I'm afraid that my ninth grader is going to fail school this year. You know, and I said, oh, don't worry. He'll, he's a good kid. He'll be all right. He'll pass. You, I mean, I'm just trying to make you feel better. You should put zero stock in that saying, right? But when Jesus says, don't be anxious, we don't have to be triggered. We can be comforted because we know that he knows what's coming. And if he can look at us and still say, don't be anxious, then we know that whatever is around the corner is something that he will sustain us through. I love that Jesus asks questions when he teaches. By the way, if you haven't caught on by now, there's really no structured points in this sermon. We're just flowing. All right? We're just, it's like a river tonight. I love that Jesus asks questions when he teaches. It forces us to think about what he's saying, right? They're often rhetorical, they're often obvious, but it, it causes us to confront what he's dealing, what he's teaching us. It demands a response, right? He gives a few questions there in 25, 26, and 27. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? Are you not of more value than the birds? Can you add a single hour to your life by being anxious? Right, you see what he's doing? He's stating just these obvious questions, forcing you to give the obvious answer. And sometimes that's what we need to do when we're dealing with the lies of the world. We need the truth of God lined up with these silly lies so that we can realize a lot of our anxiousness is stemming from insignificant things. Right? Sometimes we need to state the truth of God so that it exploits the lies around us. If we're not saturating ourselves and lending our ear to the truth of God, I promise you, you're absorbing the lies of the world. See, these lies are small, but there's a lot of them, and they're loud. And so if we don't give our ear to God's truth and God's word, then we're constantly being bombarded with these lies. And our anxiety begins to increase, and it has damaging effect on us. And so Jesus says, seriously, you think... That I care more about birds than I care about you? He's giving this obvious statement to us. Helping us realize that sometimes our anxiety is rooted in things that are hypothetical even. We're people that really get caught up on all the what ifs of life. You ever been in the shower and just have a conversation with somebody in your head that you're mad at? I win those conversations, those arguments every time. But you've just developed this whole monologue in your mind about how you're going to say this to that person you're angry with. And if they respond this way, you'll respond this way. And your blood pressure just goes up. For what? Nothing. Right? It's a hypothetical. Some of us get anxious because we're worried about what so-and-so thinks about us. Or, or maybe that person's unhappy with me. Some of us are subconsciously comparing our lives to other people. And all it does is increase anxiety. Some of us are worried about the direction of our country. I've had the question this week, aren't you worried about the Equality Act? I say, well, I'm not worried, but I am concerned. Those are different things, right? I'm concerned, which means I can inform people what it really means and what's really involved. I can write my senators, but I'm not going to lose sleep at night. And act as if God is not fully and completely aware of this situation. And that he is not fully capable of leading us uh, to good places. Jesus brings up obvious statements again. Sometimes you have to say the obvious to exploit the lies. He says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, all his, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? 
Where's the obvious? The obvious is that you are more valuable than grass. Where's the lie? The lie is that you don't always believe that. You and I think a lot of times God really isn't as interested in us as the preacher said. He doesn't really love me passionately like I've heard. He's not really involved in my life. At best, he's aware I exist. At best, he tolerates me, but does he pursue me? Does he love me? That's where the lie is. That's what you have to exploit. Our anxiousness often stems from lies that need to be exploited. And so he says to them, a phrase that he says four times in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, you of little faith. Oligapestas, he says it four times. The first time is here. The next time will be in Matthew 8 when the disciples are at sea and the storm hits and they're nervous. And then he'll say it in Matthew 14 when Peter walks on water and then freezes in fear because he's like, what am I doing? And he begins to sink. And then the fourth time in Matthew 18 when the disciples are worried that Jesus won't be able to multiply enough bread. Every time he uses that phrase and that word, and it's all coming back to unbelief. You see, the disciples had this belief that they could walk with Jesus and that they could learn from Jesus. But they didn't believe that he could do miracles. They didn't believe in the power that he truly possessed. A lot of us want to walk with God, but we don't want to trust God. We don't want to surrender to God. We want to claim God as Father. We want to appreciate Him as Savior, but we don't want to trust Him as Lord. See, unbelief fuels anxiousness. And it causes us to go in one or two directions. Some of us, uh, it paralyzes us. We shut down, all right, like Peter on the water. He took that first step, then he froze in fear, and he panicked and began to sink. Paralyzing. Some of us, the way we deal with anxiousness and anxiety is, is we, we're more like Martha in Luke 10. We just clean the house, top to bottom, right? That's our way of gaining control. There are more unhealthy things in life to do than that. But we've got to address the root, right? Martha wanted to manipulate the situation, wanted to control the environment. She couldn't just relax. She couldn't put it down. Both, again, are rooted in little faith, Jesus says, it's a faith that appreciates Jesus as Savior, but rejects Him as Lord. Right? It's a faith that is always plan B or plan C. Plan A is our strategy. Plan A is our philosophy. And when that fails, then we say, well, I guess I'll pray about it. Jesus knows this, which is why He says, what's next? He knows we have a tendency to seek first our own ideologies, seek first our own kingdom, seek first our own self-interest. And so he says that and meets us with, hey, hey, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. He's talking about priority. He's talking about what matters. He's talking about what is of ultimate purpose. When you align yourself with God, you'll all of a sudden realize that you are operating within the design of your creator. And that's where you flourish as a human being. Um, if you've ever flown on an airplane, you know that as a passenger, it's really not much more complicated than buying a ticket and finding your seat. But as a pilot, there's a lot more to it. It's a little bit more complex, right? There's a whole checklist that they follow before they even get off the ground. That checklist was implemented in 1935 after a couple of pilots ended in a fatal, died in a fatal crash. They died because they failed to check something of significant importance. Uh, they, instead of doing an external examination of the plane, they decided they didn't need to. And they ultimately forgot to release the gust locks, which are just little locks on the outside of the plane that make sure the rudders don't sway in the wind while it's parked. And so they took off with the gust locks still intact, ultimately not allowing the airplane to fly properly, which ended in a crash. And so now, the checklist for pilots, the very first thing they do is external examination. Before they get in the cockpit to fly, before they check their fuel gauge, they look at the outside of the plane. And now, in the aviation industry, that is a constant reminder 
of priority. What do you need to do first that is of most importance? We do the same thing often. We jump into our day. We jump into our routines. We jump into decision making. Without ever actually having dealt with the problems in our life, our anxieties, we sweep them to the side, we suppress them, we don't actually deal with them. We don't seek first the kingdom of God. We suppress our own emotions and our own issues. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your anxieties on him, he cares for you. Now, Jesus definitely means more than, hey, start your day with a quiet time, right? Seek first the kingdom of God is a much bigger command than, you know, read your Bible in the morning at 7 o'clock. Just like a pilot doesn't check his fuel gauge once and then never looks at it again. The, the Greek here actually communicates an ongoing posture, a continuation uh, of uh, continuous action. If you actually look at the word to seek in Greek and you parse it out, which you do, right, in your spare time, parse Greek words, you'll find that it's a, a, a present active imperative, which is a grammatical fancy way of saying this is an ongoing thing. It's the same tense that Jesus uses in 25 when he said, don't be anxious. He's not saying don't be anxious in this moment. He's saying, let your life be one continuation of not being anxious. It's a continuing disposition and posture that we walk in as believers. Seeking the kingdom, Bayleaf, means that we're pursuing the king. And then actively submitting every aspect of our lives on an ongoing basis. John Stott says it this way. He says, to seek first this kingdom is to desire as of first importance the spread of the reign of Jesus Christ. Such a desire will start with ourselves until every single department of our life, home, marriage, family, personal morality, professional life, business ethics, bank balance, tax returns, lifestyle, citizenship, is joyfully and freely submissive to Christ. When Christ isn't our Savior, when Christ isn't just our Savior, but Lord as well, we truly will find joy and flourishing in the kingdom. We'll find that his laws are good, that his ways are right. If you're here tonight struggling, asking yourself, how do I get past this anxiety? How do I get past this debilitating, paralyzing anxiousness? I'm going to lead you first to the foot of the cross. Because ultimately what we're dealing with is a broken system. We're broken people, mentally and physically. All right? Mental health is real. Mental health should be talked about more. But ultimately, there's a a spiritual side that needs to be dealt with first. We need to seek first his kingdom. So I will first lead you to the entrance of the kingdom, which is through the cross. And then I'll be happy to walk through you in that journey through counseling, therapy, other resources, tools, whatever that may be. As someone who has benefited greatly from counseling, if I were president, I would recommend it. No, I would mandate it for every person in our country. It's a good thing. If you're struggling in that area, I want to walk that journey with you. You've got plenty of people here who are willing to walk that journey with you, and I would encourage you to do so. But ultimately, we need to pray the prayer uh, of the Father in Mark 9 when he, in the same breath, said, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. There's a lot of, of us tonight here who believe. But there are these seeds of unbelief that if we were honest with ourselves are there and they're lurking and we're just too afraid to deal with them because we'd rather have a death grip on our life and our situation than really step into that liberating freedom that God offers us through his miraculous and powerful almighty hand. All right? Let's move forward in freedom. Let's... Let your next step be in pursuit of the kingdom of God. All right, church, let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your love, your goodness. Lord, we're thankful that you address this issue. Lord, you know as as humans in a fallen world, we grow anxious. 
Sometimes over things that are, are pretty are, are a big deal. Sometimes over things that are not a big deal. And either way, you meet us in the same place and you, you, you command us, Lord, not to be anxious. Not because you want to control our emotions, but because we can walk in freedom. We don't have to be anxious when the king of kings, the creator of all things, says we don't have to. So God, I pray in this moment that you would liberate those who are bound by anxiousness that is rooted in unbelief and in fear. As we often sing, God, you're a chain breaker. God, break those chains in our life. We want to be a people who are actively displaying to the world that we are not bound by the anxieties of this world. Not because they're insignificant, but because we don't have to be slaves to fear. So Lord, lead us uh, forward in pursuit of your kingdom. God, give us eyes and ears to see, to hear, God, to follow after you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.